Hello everybody, welcome to my skydive for November. So let's have a look at what we've got to look forward to getting out under the night sky throughout the month of November. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the highlights. Of course, we've got the five outer planets visible at the moment. That's Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, Mars, and Uranus as well in that particular order. Okay, Neptune's actually opposition this month, so it's its best, although it's a bit of a challenge. And then we've got the possibility of two comets this month as well, but uh, what happens with one of those remains to be seen, but, you know, we can always keep our fingers crossed. But these are comets, and they're always unpredictable. We've got the maximum of the Leonid meteor shower, and then very last end of the month, we've got the penumbral lunar eclipse. Um, although that's a bit of a tongue-in-cheek one really because I'm not really going to encourage people to get out and have a look at that one because it's going to be a bit of a non-event but uh, anyway so let's have a look at what's going on throughout the month okay if we go out about 10 o'clock at night in the middle of the month this is the 15th we've got the plow looking towards the north so here's the plow the seven stars of the plow and of course that makes up part of Ursa Major the great bear and of course these two stars here Dubai and Merak they actually point towards this star up here which is actually Polaris the pole star and that sits within about half a degree of the north celestial pole so that means it doesn't really move much in relation to the rest of the stars everything appears to go around that point and you can see it's part of this little shape here which is ursa minor the little bear so here's the great bear and here's the little bear and then in between the two bears the great bear and the little bear is draco so this is the body of draco going through between the bears and then meandering around and coming down to this trapezium shape here which is called the lozenge which is the head of draco the dragon so if we look directly overhead at the point called the zenith, you'll find this is what we see. These are the constellations we see. Cepheus is just next to Draco, which we've already had a look at. And Cepheus, I always think, looks like the shape of a house drawn by a child. Here's the body of the house, and here's the roof of the house as well. Next door to that, you've got the M or W shape of Cassiopeia, depending on which time of the year you will look at that constellation. And that's Cassiopeia the Queen. And that lies along the Milky Way, as you can see, riding across through here. And then Perseus, over here, the hero. And then up here, we've got Princess Andromeda and the eagle-eyed amongst you may have spotted the Andromeda galaxy just sitting there as well. And if we look towards the south, middle of the month at 10 o'clock in the evening, of course, we've got the bright Mars shining in Pisces. So here's Pisces, here's one fish, here's the other fish, and they're joined together by this ribbon. Below Pisces, you've got the constellation of Cetus. Everybody knows the constellation of Cetus because it's so distinctive. No, it's not. No, no, it's not distinctive at all. Few people know the constellation, uh, but there it is just below Pisces. And then over towards the southwest, getting quite low now, is Aquarius. So here it is. And this little shape up here is the water jar. And that's uh, quite distinctive, but uh, yeah, it's still not that uh, distinct because the stars aren't that bright up here just above Pisces we've got the constellation of Aries the Ram again not a very distinctive constellation and then down here we've got everybody's favorite celestial river which is Eridanus and of course it's brightest star Canopus if you go to the Canary Islands or somewhere like that you can see Canopus above the horizon and it is an absolutely brilliant star and it's the second brightest in the whole sky uh, apart from Sirius of course if we look towards the west 
middle of the month about 10 o'clock in the evening these are the stars we see and of course these are the stars that are disappearing so these are the summer stars the summer constellations are disappearing below the horizon we've got draco here there's the head of draco there's the lozenge over here and below draco you've got hercules the hero over here of course the wonderful globular star cluster messier 13 is just here but that's getting a bit low so we're going to save that for later next year of course we've got cygnus here here's the swan or the northern cross as some people call it uh, but if you look at the two wings outstretched here here's the tail of the swan and here's the head so it's flying off in that direction along the milky way which uh is right away across the sky here so if you've got dark enough skies you should be still be able to see the milky way really really nicely because it's a very bright part of the milky way but these constellations are getting lower and they're setting next door to uh, cygnus we've got lyra which is getting low to the horizon it's bright star vega over here and then down here we've got aquila and it's uh, brightest star in here altair is of course very close to the horizon at the moment and with deneb vega and altair they make up what we call the summer triangle but of course that's getting very low it's no longer summer we're well heading towards the winter now so these constellations are now disappearing here's aquarius as we said before here's the water jar uh, just over here and then if we look towards the eastern sky, these are these constellations and the stars that are coming up and rising. So they're coming up for the winter. So we recognize some of the winter constellations over here. Of course, Orion with the three belt stars and the nebula below in the sword of Orion. Of course, you've got Taurus with the absolutely fantastic star clusters, the uh, Hyades star cluster and the Pleiades star cluster up here. And of course, they're absolutely wonderful to look at when we get a lovely clear sky. And both of those are best in binoculars. So get your binoculars out and have a look at both of those. Just to the east of Orion, you've got Gemini. Here's the two twins holding hands side by side. Again, they lie along the Milky Way and there's some wonderful star clusters, especially in the feet here. And some nice nebula to take pictures of as well. And then just above that, you've got Auriga, the charioteer, and the bright star Capella up here. And that, of course, contains a number of uh, lovely star clusters within Auriga um, because it lies right along the Milky Way as well. And then down in the northeastern sky, really rising, just rising above the horizon, is the constellation of Cancer and this beautiful star cluster, Pricepe Messier 44. So let's have a look at the moon for the month and you'll see that we've got the bright full moon. Well, it was full moon on the th 31st of October on Halloween. Um, so we can see that we've got a really bright moon in the first week or so of the month. And so it's going to be around the middle of the month that you want to get out and do all your deep sky work to get all the faint stuff. Unless you're doing NAMA band imaging and stuff, of course. And then, of course, by the end of the month, it gets around to... A, a full moon again and so uh, end of the month is going to be horrible for any deep sky stuff so let's have a look at the planets the first one is mercury on the 25th of october it was at inferior conjunction so it's actually almost in between the earth and the sun but on the 10th of november it actually reaches greatest western elongation so it's as far from the sun as it can be and it's about 19 degrees it's visible in the morning sky so you have to get up before it gets too bright and you'll see the brilliant venus which we'll talk about in a moment and then a little bit further to the horizon is mercury so get out there and see if you can see mercury um, nestled down near close to the horizon and here's an image that I took, this one in blue, during daylight in May. And you can see just about this bright feature here, which is actually the bright crater Kuiper on the surface of Mercury. And this is taken with just a 120 Evo star refractor and a ZWO ASI 120MC camera. So it shows you you don't need really sophisticated equipment to actually get features on the surface of Mercury. So I was really pleased with that picture, as you can imagine. 
And then by the 20th of December, Mercury has moved around the other side of the sun, so it's on the far side of the sun, where it reaches superior conjunction. But that's not until 20th of December, but it will disappear out of our twilight morning sky very, very quickly. Venus, of course, very bright in the morning sky. Here it is, and of course you've got Mercury a little bit further down. This is the view on the 10th of November, but it is slowly sliding into the morning twilight because it's further from the sun, the Mercury, it actually takes a bit longer to get around the sun. And so it moves a little bit more sedately, so it takes longer to disappear into the twilight. We're going to see it for a good number of weeks yet. And it won't actually reach superior conjunction until next March, so it's going to take quite a while to actually get there. Just after it gets dark, around the middle of the month at six o'clock in the evening, get out there and have a look towards the south, southwest, and you'll see two bright stars. Of course, these are Jupiter and Saturn. I and mean, they've been visible now for a good number of months, um, but they are starting to slowly disappear into the evening twilight, and they'll get lower and lower each evening. But because they're moving around the solar system, they're actually traveling in an eastwards direction, they're actually going to start moving in that direction. So they're going to actually start getting higher and higher each year. And so next year, they should be a little bit higher in the sky than they have been for a number of years now. So we're looking forward to them getting a little bit better as they go. And because Jupiter orbits the sun closer than Saturn, it moves faster. And so what we're going to see by the end of the month, Jupiter is going to overtake Saturn and it's going to leave it behind. So they're going to become really close towards the end of the month. But I'll talk about a little bit more about that in December. Of course, Jupiter was at opposition on the 14th of July. So it's now past its best and so is Saturn. But it's still a great sight to look at. Here's a picture that I took on the 20th of September. You can see the cloud belts, the dark belts and the bright zones. And this one on August shows the red spot just disappearing off the limb of the planet. So one thing to look out for, have a look on the web for red spot transits and try and pick a time when Jupiter is visible and the red spot is going across the disk because it gives you a lot more interest to have a look at, especially in the smaller telescope. And this image here actually shows the belts, but it also shows a shadow of one of the Galilean moons. And this is actually Io at this particular date. And they are really nice to look out for. So look for shadow satellite shadow transits. So they're really nice. And then you can't see it very well in this image, but it's actually here is the satellite itself transiting against the planet. And so you can see that it's uh, on the planet, but uh, because the coloration and the brightness is about the same as Jupiter, you can't see it very well at all. But look out for those because they're really interesting to look out for. But of course, if you get a really nice dark sky, uh, these were taken a few weeks ago when we had a short trip down to Dorset and you can see the Milky Way quite beautifully going across here. And you can see Jupiter and Saturn and you can see Jupiter's actually making a nice glitter path on the surface of the ocean. And in fact, if you look carefully, the Milky Way is also doing that as well in these images. OK, 13th of November, Jupiter actually passes north of Pluto. Now, this is going to be quite a challenge because uh, Pluto is very faint. Uh, so here's what you're going to see or not see depending on. So here's Jupiter and there's four Galilean satellites. And this is where Pluto will actually be south of Jupiter. But it's really faint. It's about 14th magnitude, so it's quite difficult. And then mid-December, I'll talk about this next month, but Jupiter and Saturn will both pass north of the globular cluster Messier 75. So that's something to look out for next month. And then the 21st of December, Jupiter actually catches Saturn up and passes it. So uh, there's a nice conjunction. Uh, but again, I'll talk about that more about that next month. OK, 20th of July, Saturn was at opposition. So Jupiter and Saturn, here they are on the 15th of November. They're getting a little bit closer together than they were earlier in the year as Jupiter catches Saturn up. 
And here's an image that I took in 2018. You can see the rings really nicely and projecting out of the uh, disk of Saturn. And that has changed over the years. So here's an image I took on the 7th of April. And you can see the disk is now actually sticking out from the rings. So the rings are starting to close. Yeah, because Saturn's rings open up and then close again and open up the other way and close again. Over about 11 years, it does this as it goes around its orbit. And that's starting to close after being at the wire just a couple of years ago. And just a couple more images that I took. So this is my latest one on the 20th of September. You see the Cassini division in the rings quite nicely. And you can see some of the cloud uh, belts as well on the planet. And then a real challenge, especially being so low down, if you've got a pair of binoculars or a small telescope, you might just about be able to see its brightest satellite, Titan. Um, but these other satellites are really quite a challenge. These are background stars here, but these are Tethys, Rhea and Dione, which are some of Saturn's moons. But they're a real challenge, especially being so far south. Now, of course, all the excitement was of Mars last month. This is the path of Mars as it went through the sky in Pisces. So 1st of August, it was here, 18th of August, 1st of September. And then the 10th of September, as the Earth overtook it, it was seen to go in the opposite direction. So that's where it was on the 1st of October. And an opposition around about the middle of last month. Here's where it was. And there it is on the 1st of November. And then the 14th of November, it's just stopped and it's starting to now resume its normal motion. It's retrograde motion. This is known as retrograde motion because it's moving in the opposite direction. And that's a direction caused by the Earth overtaking it. So it looks like it's going backwards. And then here it started to resume its normal forward direction. And then 1st of December, it's here and it's starting to speed up again. The 15th of December, it'll be here. 25th of December is very close to this open um, cluster of galaxies and then the 31st of December finds it here so it's going to be in our sky for a good number of months yet but of course it's past its best it's going to start getting smaller and smaller every single day so it will start to shrink so it become more challenging to observe and more challenging to get images. So if you look at how Mars has changed size throughout the uh, last few months here it is in January, February March in April when it was very low to the horizon in the morning sky I attempted an image I got the phase but I didn't really get any surface features and then May June July August was when I finally got a chance to uh, get some images of Mars um, during July I was really distracted by comet Neowise but there you go but you can see the phase quite nicely you can see the uh, southern polar cap was quite big then and then in September, I managed to get my best image so far of Mars. And you see the polar cap has really shrunk quite a bit. Um, and that was, yeah, that was in the, on the 14th of September. I did get some images in October, but I haven't bettered that one yet. Even though it was at its best and biggest in October, I haven't bettered that image yet. And then, of course, in November and December, you can see just how much Mars is going to shrink as the distance between Mars and Earth increases. So apparent size looks much smaller. And then next October is actually going to reach solar conjunction. That's on the far side of the sun. So we're not going to see Mars um, really much uh, next summer and into the winter. So uh, we're going to have to wait until 2022 before we see it again. But it's not going to be as big as it was in October. We're going to have to wait till 2035 for it to be as big as it was um, this year. Neptune, the uh, most remote planet, is actually at opposition on the 11th of September. Here it is here. And it's in the constellation of Aquarius. This is Pisces, just for reference. And Mars is just off the uh, screen to the left here. It's at magnitude 7.86, so it's about eighth magnitude. So you do need a telescope. Um, or a pair of binoculars to be able to identify it. Uh, but it is difficult. It's a long way out, so it does look very, very small. 
One of the comets that we're hopefully going to observe, but this one looks a bit doubtful at the moment uh, because uh, I've not seen any news about this one, but this is the path that it should have. Um, it was discovered in August this year and it was heading north from the southern hemisphere and it was meant to reach about ninth magnitude. This is one of the comets that we were meant to see this year. It was discovered in August and it's heading north. It's currently around about ninth magnitude, I think, but I'm not too sure because it seems to be a bit sketchy at the moment. And it was reckoned to reach about plus seven or plus six magnitude. So it's not going to be as good as Neowise or the other Neowise was a few months ago. But it should have still been quite a nice um, object to especially image and this was the path of it across the sky that it was going to take so it's going to pass Corvus the crow is quite low in the south here's Bertie's here the herdsman and the bright star Arcturus just to get your bearings and you've got Virgo in the middle here with the bright star spiker but the sun's going to be here so this is going to be quite low in the eastern sky before sunrise and here's the comet on the 10th of October. That's where it was, just below Corvus. And it's near Messier 68, a globular star cluster. And it was near the Sombrero Galaxy on the 16th of October. And then by the end of October, here's where it was. So it's really at its highest in the morning sky at that, on that particular date. So this is when it was going to be at its about its brightest. And then the 9th of November, that's where it will be, very close to this galaxy cluster, NGC 5434, involved in that little cluster there. And by the 1st of December, it's gone a little bit further south again, so it's going to start getting into the twilight. And then on Christmas Day, it's actually going to be close to Messier 5, another globular cluster, but I think by that time it's going to be disappeared into the twilight and all expectations are that at the moment it's not performing very well so uh, it's not going to give us much of a show at all. Uranus was at opposition on the 31st of October it's still visible in the evening sky and it's not far from Mars in Aries so here's Mars over here and here's Uranus just over here and here's a very bad webcam image I took of it a few years ago. You can see the bluey green colour, but that's about it, really. And then another camera I used, monochrome, rather than the coloured webcam. And you can see the overexposed uh, image of Uranus. And you can see three of its moons here, and these, the rest of these are background stars. But these are three of its moons, Umbriel, Oberon, and Titania. Okay, so really pleased uh, to be able to capture that just from my back garden great fun and then on the evening of uh, opposition these are where the moons would have been and so you can see those there and the magnitudes of those are about the same magnitude as Pluto 13.87 14.08 14.3 and nearly 15th magnitude so they are quite difficult the other comet that might be of great interest is comet C2020 M3 Atlas and here's the path of it in the sky. And lucky for us, it makes it easy to identify because it passes a number of really well-known um, stars. It was discovered in June of this year, and it was in the Southern Hemisphere, but it's now heading north. It's actually visible in the morning sky if you want to get up, but it's quite low down at the moment. It's around about eighth magnitude, and it's almost at its brightest. So we don't think it's going to get that much brighter, but it's a comet you never know. Okay, so let's have a look at where it's going to be. So this is the constellation of Orion, of course, with the three belt stars. This is the bright white star Rigel in Orion's left foot. Of course, we've got Betelgeuse in his right shoulder. And you've got Bellatrix, which is in his left shoulder. So the comet's going to pass really close to that star. And here's Taurus the bull with the Hyades and the Pleiades you mentioned earlier. And the bright red star Aldebaran nestled within the Pleiades, the Hyades there. And you've got the bright star Naf in the horns of the bull, uh, so it's going to pass barely close to that. And then Aurega, this uh, kite-shaped constellation with the bright star Capella up here, 
and it's going to pass really close to that. So let's have a look at some dates associated with that. So on the 31st of October, here's where it is, just below Orion in the constellation of Lepus, the hare. On the 3rd and 4th of November, it's very close to Rigel, just to the left of it. So hopefully we should be able to get some good views of it when it's there. And then the 10th and 11th of November, it's going to be just to the right of the belt stars of Orion. So hopefully we should be able to use that as a guide to get us to the comet. On the 15th and 16th of November, it passes fairly close to the left of Bellatrix, which is in the left shoulder of Orion. So hopefully we should be able to easily identify it then. Then it passes through a little bit of a gap where it doesn't pass anything of real note. And then it passes into the horns of Taurus on the 26th of November. And you can see how these tick marks have got wider apart because the comet's closest to Earth and close to perihelion, so it's moving at its quickest. Once we get to the 4th of December, you can see it passes the star Nath in the horn of the bull. And then you can see these start now starting to slow down as the distance from Earth increases. And then by here, the 1st of January, New Year's Day, it's actually right up near the star Capella. So that's where the comet should be. But how bright it's going to get, who knows? We'll just have to keep going out and have a look and see what happens. OK, so a few things to look out for during the month, 2nd and 3rd of November. The moon just after full is going to be close to the Pleiades and the Hyades on the 2nd and the 3rd. So that's it on the 3rd. You can see it's moved a little bit from where it was the night before. On the 4th of November, we actually get a chance to see Mari Orientale. And this is this huge impact uh, feature on the surface of the moon. On the 4th of November, we actually get to see a rare view of Mari Orientale. And this is its huge impact feature, which is just over the limb of the moon. So we only see this right on the very edge of the moon, which is a bit of a shame, really, because it's an absolutely fantastic feature, which we'd love to see in much greater detail. But we only catch glimpses of it. So here's a view of it. You can see Grimaldi here. This is this uh, crater here, which is the same as this one. And then this part here is this part here. You can see that going across there. And this part here is this part here. So you can see that quite nicely. And this crater here is the same as this one here. But there are certain liberation because the moon wobbles from side to side slightly. So it brings features on the limb just around a little bit so we can see them a little bit clearer. So in this image, you can see it's fairly close to the edge. But in this image, which was taken earlier this year, you can see it's moved in a little bit. So we can see these peaks that were very close to the edge here, are actually a little bit further in the limb. So we can see it in a little bit more detail. And you can see why we go out and take the same image, an image of the same object time after time after time. Because this was a really good image I was pleased with. But this one, as you can see, the quality of that one is much, much better. When you get a really good night of imaging and the seeing's really good, then you get better images. So that's why we go out night after night trying to take lots of images of the same object. They're not all the same because sometimes some are much better than others. And as you can see, this one is much, much better. And of course, it helps because we're seeing a little bit better of Mari Orientale in this one than we did in that one as well, because it's further around the limb slightly more. But it can get a little bit more over the limb than that. And uh, there's some, a couple of favorable liberations to see Mari Mari Orientale this year. One is the 4th of November, there's a gibbous moon, so it's visible from late evening. So, as long as the moon's above the horizon, we should be able to see Mari Orientale on the western limb of the moon. Of course, it's called the Eastern Sea because back in the 1960s, the International Astronomical Union changed the east and west uh, orientation of the moon. Uh, so 
when it was named, it was on the eastern part of the moon. So it was called the Eastern Sea. But now, of course, it's on the western limb of the moon uh, because of the International Astronomical Union change leading up to the Apollo missions. And then in December, we got another one as well. But I'll talk about that next month when we come to that one again. OK, 7th of November, the moon's close to Pricepi, the beehive cluster. So here it is. So uh, there's the beehive cluster and there's the moon. Of course, the brightness of the moon is still going to be quite bright. So it's not quite um, third quarter moon. Um, so it's going to be still quite bright. So it will blot out some of the stars in the cluster. 10th of November, Mercury reaches western elongation, so it's visible in the eastern sky before dawn. Of course, remember, Venus is going to be very, very bright, visible in the morning sky for a good number of weeks yet. And then Mercury is going to be visible for a number of days either side of the 10th. So get out there um, either side of the 10th and look out for Mercury very close to the horizon. It's going to be 19 degrees from the sun, so at its maximum. A couple of days later, Mercury is a little bit close to the horizon, but the moon's moved down a little bit, and we should have some really nice Earth shine in there, showing up the dark side really, really nicely. But the next evening, watch the moon, because the next morning, the moon's moved down a little bit, Mercury's a little bit closer to the horizon, but the moon is almost in between Venus and Mercury and should make an absolutely spectacular sight. Lovely thin crescent moon and the earth shine on the moon should be fantastic. So it's a great photographic opportunity for those of you who take images. But if you go out on the 14th, the morning of the 14th, you have to go out a little bit later. So this is about just after half six in the morning. You can see Venus, you can see Mercury, but the moon has now moved down here and it's going to be an extremely thin crescent and very strong earth shine because as seen from the moon the earth is going to be almost full so it's going to send a lot of reflected light towards the moon so hopefully we should be able to see a fantastic view of venus mercury and this beautiful very thin crescent moon with the earth shine but it is going to be very low to the horizon so uh, you need a good low horizon to be able to see that but get out and have a look 14th to the 22nd of november is national astronomy week it's all about the planet mars uh, there's going to be lots of events. We're going to be trying live streaming events to actually show people live images of the moon from our observatories. So go to astronomyweek.org.uk to find out more details about that. 17th and 18th of November, we've got the maximum of the Leonid meteor shower. And if you find some meteors, or you see some meteors, I should say, Draw the line back, and if they point to this area here, which is the sickle of Leo, then that tells you it's a Leonid meteor. Don't look towards Leo because most of the meteors aren't going to be visible in the constellation itself. They will be all around the sky. So look some degrees away from Leo, and you should see some more meteors there. The only trouble is um, there's Regulus, the bright star Regulus. These are associated with Comet Temple Tuttle. Uh, but at only 15 per hour and this is a zenithal hourly rate and that's a rate at which you would see meteors if the radiant which is the point where the meteors seem to come from is actually dead above your head at the zenith and that never happens so we're going to see 10 maybe 12 per hour um, so it's not going to be spectacular but this meteor shower has a 33 year cycle and there was a meteor storm in 1966, which was seen really, really nicely from the United States. And it was also extremely active in 1999. And I was lucky enough to get up the morning before. It was meant to be really good. And I saw some absolutely spectacular meteors that morning. And that, so I've been spoiled for meteors. So I'm not going to make a big effort to get up and see the Leonids this year. Um, and there might be another storm in 2032. So put in your diary uh, for 2032 for the next meteor storm. 22nd of November, the Lunar X and the Lunar V are going to be visible. This is what we call a clear obscure effect. So it's made from the light and shade of the uh, rising or setting sun as it goes over certain lunar features. The ideal time is actually 2.30 in the afternoon. It's not ideal because it's going to be daylight, but it should still be visible once uh, nighttime comes, but it won't be quite as distinct. 
So here's the lunar X. You can see the lunar X here shown up quite nicely, just as the sun is rising above these features. And it's made up from the three craters, Blancius, Lycaea, and the Purbach craters. This is Purbach, hidden in the shadow, Lycaea, and the Blancius. I think I've pronounced those names right, but I've probably got them wrong. Um, and Luna V is actually in the southern part of Mare Vaporum, so it's actually a bit further north than uh, this area of the uh, moon. And you can see this is Rima Hyginus. These are some of the uh, craters around it, Manilius, Trisnecker, Rioticus, Godin, and Agrippa. I always think Agrippa sounds like a, should be a wrestler. And here's the lunar V, and you can see that as the sun rises over this feature, it looks like a V shape. So uh, that's quite nice to look out for that. 29th of November, the moon's going to be in between the Hyades and the Pleiades in Taurus, and the red eye of the ball, Aldebaran. And this is the view about 8.30 in the evening. And then the 30th of November, we've got a penumbral lunar eclipse. Now, I normally get excited about eclipses, but not this one. This is a penumbral lunar eclipse that only goes into the penumbral shadow. And the other thing is, the eclipse starts at 7.30 in the morning. By this time, the sky is going to be starting getting bright, and the moon is getting really low. And the moon actually sets at about 8.41, so just over an hour later. And we're not really going to see much anyway because it's a penumbral lunar eclipse. If we look at the diagram from the NASA Eclipse website, you can see here's the dark shadow. So this is when we get a total lunar eclipse. This is a shadow that produces that wonderful red color that we see during uh, an eclipse. And the moon at its maximum, here it is here, is in this partial shadow. So it's not quite as dark. It might be a bit darker on the edges further in than it is on the outside, but you're not really going to see that. It will be very subtle effect. And of course, we're only going to see it as it comes into the shadow before it sets. So we're not really going to see much. So don't set your alarm to get up for the eclipse. And then the 30th of November, we'll notice that Jupiter and Saturn are really starting to get closer together. There's no social distancing going on here. And uh, yeah, they will get closer and closer together, and we'll see that next month when I do the next skydive. Okay, if you want to carry the skydive around, if you go to my website, star-gazing.co.uk forward slash diary, and look at my skydive on TeamUp, and you can even download the TeamUp app and put the skydive on your phone and carry it around with you. And I try and keep that as up to date as I can as I get more information. And this is what it looks like. And you can see it's got lots and lots of events on there that you can uh, hopefully get out and see and set yourself reminders as well. OK, just before I finish, I've got to plug my astrophotography and astronomy workshops because I'm not able to do those physically at the moment. So they're all virtual. The next one is the 5th of December 2020. And if you're getting into Affinity Photo, I've got an astrophotography image processing workshop on the 5th of December for a couple of hours and go to my website star-gazing.co.uk forward slash affinity and you can book that and then just a reminder to everybody the virtual astronomy club is keeping astronomy social during these uh, difficult times and we meet now on the first and the third Tuesday of every month at 7 p.m. And the web page for all the details on how to join in the astronomy fun is virtual-astro-club.com. So keep safe, keep well, and keep looking up. Bye.